See You Now is a podcast highlighting the innovative and human-centered solutions that nurses are coming up with to solve for today's most challenging healthcare problems. Created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association and hosted by nurse economist and health tech specialist, Shauna Butler. We'd never seen anything like this before. These young men were showing up with Kaposi's sarcoma, with pneumocystis pneumonia. We didn't even know how it was transmitted. And no one really knew what was going on. In 1980, hospitals started to see a group of patients present with unexpected illnesses, opportunistic infections, and atypical, somewhat strange pneumonias that suggested an underlying immune deficiency. This was the beginning of what we now know as the AIDS epidemic. It was an epidemic that brought up everything that comes with an epidemic, uh, misinformation, hysteria, fear. HIV points its finger at everything that is wrong in society. The message was consistent. These are hedonistic, homosexual, queers brought all of this on themselves, and that there's no reason for us to even concern ourselves with it except to protect ourselves so that we don't get this. This hysteria and discrimination extended from the gay community into towns across America. Children who had acquired HIV through blood transfusions were being marginalized and ostracized. Families were shamed and shunned. And in the midst of uncertainty, people were suffering and they were dying, many of them alone and in shame. No one seemed to be really taking care of the patients. There were nurses and physicians and support staff that wouldn't go near these patients. They were, they were left alone in rooms. Nursing care, as I knew it, was not being practiced. One group of nurses at San Francisco General Hospital took action and created Ward 5B. For me, I looked at it and I felt like, this is the end of the world. I mean, this is Armageddon, and therefore I have nothing to lose. So I jumped in, never looked back. We were angry about the level of care that was not being provided, and we were passionate that we could do the work. By the time I came to the ward, Cliff and Allison had really laid the ground for work. And for them, as I hear them tell it, it was never a question. And the innovations that came from their compassion, their research and expertise, their outrage, and their refusal to sit back and allow people to go without high-quality care have made a lasting impact on how we care. Empathy assisted us to learn from our patients because patients, they need to be partners in that drive towards innovation. It has transformed how hospitals work and how chronic care works. It's about community, about relationship, about love. Compassion can nurture itself if you give it free reign. This is See You Now, and I'm Shauna Butler. Stay with us. Since the first reported cases of AIDS in 1981, HIV and AIDS have been one of humanity's deadliest and most persistent epidemics. Although extraordinary progress has been made in the fight against its spread, the HIV pandemic continues. In this episode of See You Now, we return to the 1980s and meet nurses Cliff Morrison, Allison Moed, and Guy Vandenberg, who cared for and about AIDS patients at San Francisco General Hospital. They reflect on how compassion-driven innovation created a new model of care that served to maintain dignity and humanity in the face of shame and fear and inspired Johnson & Johnson to commission the documentary film 5B. The documentary film 5B captures the unvarnished story of the nurses and caregivers who, in 1983, took unprecedented action to build the first hospital AIDS ward in the United States so they could comfort, protect, care for, and love their patients living and dying with AIDS. It was an all-volunteer staff, everyone from the nurses, clerks, cleaning and food service, clergy, all of them. They created these practices based in humanity and holistic well-being during a time when people were consumed by fear. The result is an uplifting yet candid look at a pivotal moment in American history and a celebration of determined and innovative nurses worthy of renewed recognition. 
Cliff and Allison. So it's a story about people. Who are the people in this story? Mm, the people, the people are people that uh, contracted HIV and AIDS uh, very early on when there was when no one really knew what it was, and it primarily hit the gay community in the U.S. And the story is about San Francisco being one of the epicenters of the epidemic and San Francisco general. And uh, the nurses there that really just kind of rallied around these patients and said, we're going to do what nurses are supposed to do. We're going to stand up. We're going to advocate. We're going to provide the best care that we know how to provide. And you know, we're, we're going to provide compassionate care to people that no one else wants to. And we take an oath when we go into nursing. And, and it's very much like a, a sacramental oath that we put aside our own fears and that we're there for our patients. And so that's what this story's about. We had registered nurses. Mm-hmm. We were all registered nurse staff. We had social workers and then we had the Shanti counselors. Those, and, and, of course, we had physicians. But our physicians were often teaching staff. You know, San Francisco General is a teaching hospital. And one of the moments I remember is a physician coming to me and saying, I need to tell my patient that he's dying and I... I don't know how. And, you know, this was a first for me as a nurse where we formally became teachers for the physician staff. So there was a breaking down of a barrier that had been there through most of my nursing career. You know, I became a nurse in 1971 where physicians were at the top of the hierarchy, and nurses did what we were told, basically. So we were not nurses doing what we were told. We were nurses who owned the care on that unit, and we were teachers and teaching our model of care, that the patients not be also at the bottom of the hierarchy, but that the patients were really at the top, that we would learn what their needs were, evaluate them, question them, assess them in all aspects of their being to find out what was important to them. And then we became advocates for that with the physician staff so that there wasn't a cookie-cutter approach. There was a patient-centered care approach. And I think that was a big innovation. You've also got another set of characters in this story that help us to understand where we were as a culture, where we were as a society, what what we valued, what we were afraid of, um, what we embraced. I was so fortunate to see the film with a group of people. It was in community. It was hosted by the Austin AIDS Society. And there were so many elements in the film that took me back to a time that Without having the sounds, the hairstyles, the furniture styles, it was important that those details were in the film to remind me of that moment in time, what it was like when we had our very first patients who came in with a set of symptoms and a very rapid progression oftentimes with this um, illness, and we had no idea what it was. I think if everybody had been doing the right thing and if everyone had been compassionate, this would have just been another story. But I think, you know, what makes an interesting story is that you have protagonist and antagonist. And in this situation, because of the nature of the illness, uh, the, the, the way that it you know, struck uh, in this country and in in the gay community and how it affected health care and then the hysteria and the misinformation and then the politics that got pulled into it. It brought, it was a time that brought out the best and it brought out the worst. And you put those two things together and you've got, I think, a very compelling story. 
But these know, were a very specific set of patients. Well, Who were these you know, in, patients? Yeah, yeah. These these patients were people that were coming in, um, in in the beginning, almost all. I, I mean, in 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 my experience, all it was a hundred percent were gay men. I had already been um, in healthcare for twenty years. I had already been a nurse for fifteen years, um, <clears throat> and yet. None of us had ever seen anything like this. We'd never seen something where people came in and they might come in with symptoms and within just a matter of weeks, they were emaciated and dying. And the progression of the disease was such that it was absolutely devastating. It seemed that, that there was nothing that we could do to, to alter it. All that we could do was try to make people comfortable. And that in itself was just a a huge challenge because we were all dealing with something that we'd never seen before. And at that particular point in time, we didn't even know how it was transmitted. And uh, so there was all this fear about, oh my God, am I going to get this? And, you know, in in the beginning, I think, you know, uh, I think it was normal, I'm using that term rather loosely, that providers would stand back and say, oh, well, gee, what's my risk? You know, I have a family, I have children, I have to be careful about what I do. Uh, For me, it was a little bit different because um, I was alone in the world. I was single. Um, uh, I am a gay man. And uh, I saw that these were my brothers and and that they were, you know, that they were being um, bombarded and attacked at the same time. Allison, as you think back a couple of decades ago, and we were seeing a virus and an illness emerge that we didn't really know much about. Can you talk us through the timeline? What do you recall about the earliest cases of, at that point in time, what we didn't know to be AIDS, but we understand to be AIDS today? What I, I came to San Francisco in 1979. Within about a year after that, people started to appear with these strange opportunistic infections that hadn't been seen in the hospitals for many years except for people with severe immunocompromise. So the fact that these young men were showing up with Kaposi's sarcoma, with pneumocystis pneumonia, was highly unusual. And no one really knew what was going on. I came into the hospital as a per diem nurse and... I saw in the hospital setting that the patients were housed in isolation rooms at the far ends of the hallways because no one really understood why they were showing up with these illnesses and people were afraid that they were going to perhaps contract them. And what was disturbing to me was that no one seemed to be really taking care of the patients Nursing care, as I knew it, was not being practiced. So the patients were not only isolated, the patients' basic needs weren't being attended to. And so they sometimes weren't being cleaned up properly. No one was talking to them. They weren't getting their food or their meal trays. The meal trays would pile up outside their doors instead of being brought into the room, instead of having the trays and the food set up for them if they needed assistance. And I was struck. I was I was speechless. I really didn't understand. And then I would hear homophobic remarks about these guys. So the, the lack of care, the fear, was being... F- fueled, I thought, by homophobia. This was then this was very disturbing to me. At the same time there were starting to be notices um, in the Castro district about this this gay cancer. I had gay friends who were very I was very close to and they were starting to talk about it. But no one really understood um, quite what was going on or what it was going to what was going to happen with it. What was seemed clear to me and to, and to others was that it wasn't an airborne disease or one that was easily caught, that instead it was something that was probably transmitted maybe through body fluids or, or blood contact. But um, 
people weren't dropping like flies after riding in the muni bus and uh, or walking down the street. So it was obviously hitting a specific population and a population that was already stigmatized. As this was unfolding, uh, uh, I joined a volunteer group in the community called the Shanti Project. And the Shanti Project was the first community group that saw that there was a problem going on in the community. And Shanti had been around for 20 years providing support services and counseling services uh, to people in life-threatening situations, primarily cancer. Uh, so they had the wherewithal and the, and the infrastructure in the community to start doing this. And because of the nature of what they did in San Francisco, they had a significant number of gay volunteers. And they were the first people to step forward. And so almost immediately, uh, I joined them and went through their training program. So as we started seeing more of the patients coming into the hospital, the administration and the other nurses started turning to me and saying, you know something about this. Will you help us? And so that's how I got involved. Once he accepted this charge from the director of nurses at San Francisco General, once he agreed that he would lead the uh, the development of this unit, he he looked around for staff, and there was a notice posted on the bulletin boards that this new unit was going to open to care for these patients who were suffering from an unknown virus, presumably virus. At that point, I was working elsewhere per diem. I was working in psychiatry. I was working on a spinal cord injury rehab unit. I was working in a hospice. That's kind of how I, how I roll. I, those were, were my interests, people who, who were dealing with emotion, people who were at pivotal points in their lives. And I was also very invested, just personally caring about members of the gay community, that, who they were my friends. So someone said, there's this unit opening at San Francisco General. You, you might be interested. And I thought, I am really, really interested. And I went and applied. I remember sitting with Cliff in this, I remember the room, and that he interviewed me, and I, I had my fingers crossed the whole time because I was so inspired by the idea of providing really providing good nursing care. And I was chosen. <laughs> I was selected. Oh, my gosh. I was so happy. And uh, the we had a wonderful... The adrenaline or- rush of innovation. Yes. Yes, yes. I can hear it. And it wasn't just the innovation. It was the idea of somehow I in me, and I don't remember that Cliff gave me this idea, but somewhere in me I thought... If we give this our all, if we give it our best shot, we're going to make this go away. Now, is, I mean, why would I think this? I, but I did. It Maybe it was because I wanted so desperately to think that it could go away, that it, this was going to be a short-lived phenomenon. And in the meanwhile, we would take care of these guys. And we had... Uh, a very multifaceted orientation. It wasn't only about infection control. We would practice on the unit, but we also did death exercises. We had Shanti counselors who were hired to be on the unit to um, to help guide patients through some of their emotional issues. And we we were ready. We we were just ready to do this work. And we were we were angry about the level of care that was not being provided, and we were passionate that we could could do the work, we would do the work, and we were just, we were ready to go. And we we were filled with love and concern, and I think pride in our ability as nurses to do, to do the right thing, to do our work. And so there we were. Guy, I want to bring you into the conversation because you came to the unit a little later, right? By the time I came to the ward, Cliff and Allison had had really laid the groundwork with the the others that that were there in the beginning. And for them, as I hear them tell it, it was never a question. It was never a question. And before San Francisco? Yes, I went to, to high school and college in the Netherlands. 
before I came to the States in um, 1984. And then in my work, um, when I came to San Francisco, I initially, before I worked at the hospital, I worked at a hospice. And then I was in ACT UP to try to raise awareness and express my anger and grief about what was going on and hold people responsible in government and in the pharmaceutical industry and just the general public. This is, this is happening now, this is happening here, and we can't be quiet about it. You're listening to See You Now. I'm your host, Shauna Butler, and we're talking with Guy Vandenberg, Allison Moed, and Cliff Morrison, nurses featured in the documentary film 5B about the first ward set up to care for AIDS patients in the early 80s in San Francisco. Coming up, we'll talk about specific innovations that emerged from the ward. But first, one thing that made this ward unique was the community and the characters in it. And one of the main characters in the film is the city itself. In decades prior, San Francisco was a city with a loud voice in civil, social, and political movements. Its colorful history, multicultural character, and tradition of tolerance underlaid the community's compassionate response when large numbers of HIV and AIDS patients needed medical services. Due largely to the city's inclusive political and community response to the epidemic, Local politicians, like Diane Feinstein, approached it like a public health emergency and acted accordingly. These factors and the public health approach were critical to the nurses, physicians, and health professionals motivated to care for the patients of 5B. Stay with us. There are community members that had a huge impact on what the model of care was in 5B. Uh, uh, So much of the response to the epidemic and so much of how 5B was uh, implemented and developed and evolved was because of all of the support within the community. And in the film is this wonderful character, uh, real life character, Rita Rocket, and and she's you know although she's very much a real person and i talk to rita and communicate with her almost daily um uh, because she was you know she was more than lifelike she was you know she was out there she was like a rocket <laughs> perfect name i mean <laughs> yes she was true. born and destined for this role wasn't she I, oh she was I, she'd been I, she'd been a waitress i i believe and she she had many gay friends and she came to the unit and saw how many of her her friends were there she came to see someone and she decided she wanted to make make brunch and bring 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 a sunday brunch and she came to my office and she asked if she could do that and i thought wow what a wonderful idea and it happened. So here, Rita had a dance background. Rita was, she was bright and snappy. She's a girl from Ohio, and that's where she is now. A little bit of a southern accent, very kind of down home. But she did everything she could. She started creating these brunches. She had brunches for 18 years, Sunday brunch, every other Sunday on the unit. And she would go into every room She would get patients out, maybe someone who hadn't been out of their room all week, and they would they would look forward to her visit, come down to our our lounge at the end of the hallway, and she did little tap dance shows. She would dress up as the Easter Bunny on Easter. She always, you know, she was seasonal. (laughs) She was timely. (laughs) She was funny. She was loving, and she had her reader reader rocket. Brunch bunch, who were who were guys from the community, they came in too. We also had the Godfather Fund, and they came, they would come. They would provide um, bags of slippers and teddy bears and toothbrushes and things for people who whose funds were diminishing and and didn't have them. Ropes. We had the wonderful Richard Locke, who was a porn star. Very well known in the gay community, but he came in and he did massage, foot massage. He was a lovely, sweet man, and he he just brought so much good 
cheer and and uh, imagine it. They, people felt he was a movie star, and he was here. He was massaging your foot. And, you know, the guys used people with such loving kindness. And we had the Cookie Man who brought cookies, and we had Marty Cox who who brought newspapers and whatever. And you know, we just had people who who came in and brought love. When when, when I look at the characters that uh, comprised Five B, all the people that were there, it's like my goodness, uh, you know, the universe certainly came together. And I think that any number of us, you know, it, it was almost like we were born for these roles. 5B really came to fruition and developed and evolved because of a community that completely supported it. And it was the gay community. It was the straight community. It was the religious community. It was, it, it, it was amazing how out of the midst of all of this negativity and, and, this fear mongering that it brought the best out as well. And that best was all this community support from uh, restaurants, uh, from merchants in the community who, who would donate things and support us and uh, provide funds for us to continue the level of care and services that we were providing. Because one of the things you saw the film that there was an accusation by those in the community who wanted to attack us and the politicians that we were spending all of these public funds. Well, we weren't. Everything that you see in the film about 5B that made it look special, that, you know, the flowers, the, the decorations, the, you know, the, the, the party atmosphere that, that was so important for us to continue, none of that came from public funds. All of that was from the community. And... You know, I have to say, in in looking at the film, I would have never thought that because the the images that I saw, all of those added elements of decor or fellowshipping, where there was food brought in, there was an element of homemade love. This was not at all commercial, or not to say that it wasn't professional looking, but what you could see is the personalization, the authentic offering. It wasn't a function of, oh, let me, at this day and age, let me call something like um, a, a DoorDash or an Uber Eats to have somebody deliver you a, a, a meal. These were hand-prepared and made with such love. So I, I didn't, I, I, that's interesting that that would be a concern or a, um, a pushback that you would get. What I saw was a lot of time and a lot of love being put into it. Yes, yeah. yes. Community is, is, is everything. Community is life. Um, community is where we're, where we're born and, and, and hopefully where we're surrounded with love at the end of our lives as well. Um, the person is a person through other people. I am because you are. And uh, that it also means for me, I need for you to survive. I need for you to survive because I need you to, to survive myself. Um, I am not without you. So that is what community means. And, and I think that becomes most, people become most aware of that when, when they face hardship. We had to support one another in different ways. And one of the way, those ways was getting together if there was a particularly difficult death. One of those ways was welcoming the community onto the unit and we created our own volunteer group on the unit. We developed a volunteer handbook. This was spearheaded by the wonderful Steve Keith, one of, also one of the first nurses on the unit, and he became our volunteer coordinator. So we, people were eager to give from the community, and we brought them. This was another innovation. We brought them into the hospital setting, but in order to do that, we had to be sure that they knew what their role was, that they were supported and monitored appropriately, and that they also were part of, of the hospital volunteer community. And there was a blossoming. There was a literal blossoming because the unit was often covered with flowers and, <laughs> and plants, and there was there was life coming on to a place where we saw so much indignity because these de diseases really stripped our patients of their dignity. We saw so much indignity and so much death. 
so we could bring laughter and joy, and we did. There was a lot of laughter and joy on that unit. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't just a dark place. Gosh, Allison, as the leader of the unit, you certainly assembled quite a cast of characters. Uh, I can't even, I don't claim any credit. I just did, I just did what I could, and they were all so eager to make it happen. And, you know, uh, Hank Plant, who's in the film, and he was, he was the, the one reporter. of the first, yeah. yes, mm-hmm. openly gay Journalist. TV reporters. Mm-hmm. He said, when we, he and I were doing an interview, or a, I don't remember, a podcast, and he said, it was a love affair. He said it was a love affair in that unit, and he was right. It was it was a love affair. We we loved, we really loved, and we loved, we loved one another. We loved being there. As hard as it was, it was it was a labor of love, and it, and I don't mean to gloss over it because it was very hard, and people, it was it was very hard to deal with the death, and there were people who had problems with drugs, or people who had problems with alcohol. There were people who just emotionally, you know, maybe could only stay with it for so long, and it it wasn't easy. But as we were there, we gave it our all, and uh, we I think we were sustained by the example of our patients and uh, by our charge to do to do right by them as nurses and as human beings. It was all about love and compassion. Yeah. I, and when you say compassion, it reminds me of a very important element that the film 5B captures so beautifully, and that is the concern, that the very real concern of how do we as healthcare providers make sure that we don't end up being part of uh, spreading the disease and making sure that we have very safe practices to manage that. There's an element, uh, uh, the storyline of one of the nurses on the unit who, through care and a needle stick, became HIV positive. And there's a, there's um, a feeling. I mean, there, it's there, it's in the words, but I think it's more in the tone of the way the story is told, of how you were able to teach us so much along the lines of safety, but done in a way that just really captures the compassion. What were you guys doing that was so different from some of our other colleagues to foster and expand our ability to care with compassion? At the time, that really wasn't a part of our care model. It was, you know, we're concerned, we're professional, but in some ways we're um, distant and detached. We're not fully present. And being compassionate is not detachment at all. It is, I am here, I am, I see you, um, I'm a witness to this, I'm coming to you with my with all of my humanity as well as my expertise but I'm here as another human being and that was that was new in how we were caring yes. for people yeah I I hope that Mary McGee will always always be remembered and really universal precautions uh, is the gift that she gave us and and that today that that's a standard that we see everywhere in hospitals and in healthcare practice when I look at this now, some of the things that I'm most proud of and feel the most positive about uh, with our contributions from the nurses, from everyone in healthcare, from, you know, from the doctors that we worked with, from the counselors and the volunteers and all the community people, I can look at that now and say, wow, we changed the way that nursing and healthcare was delivered in the hospitals. And those changes are very evident today. When you go into a hospital, many of the things that we pioneered 35 years ago are, are now commonplace, and it's what you see. It, it's how people are treated. It's definition of family. It's how how people are treated as visitors and when people can visit. And, and if people friends, relatives, family can can stay with that person while they're in the hospital. Um, pets visiting, pet therapy came out of all of that. And when I look at all of that and, and I think, wow, you know, that was a wonderful contribution. Uh, in addition to that, you know, some of the things that were specific were that our contribution, particularly Mary's contribution, and that is a contribution to not only nursing, but to healthcare delivery 
and to the safety of all healthcare workers who have to come in contact with body fluids and sharks. And all those practices are in place today. We started doing that, and Mary became the crusader who really took that forward. And I hope that she will always be honored and remembered for that. I'm replaying the stories and the, the images in my mind. And this was the our earliest parts of my career as a nurse. I was working at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C. at that point in time. And what struck me is how young, vibrant, unexpected, and young men coming in feeling just terrible and fatigued and in their beds curled up with no energy to um, to do anything. It took energy to sleep, but then a great deal of sadness and loneliness and being surrounded by this shroud of, I don't know how to talk about this. And we would ask, can we call your family? Where is your family? And the stories, just the heart-wrenching stories of I haven't spoken with my family in years. Um, most of the other times in my experience, it had been, I need to call my, my sister. Um, I want my my parents. Um, how can you help me connect? And this was a very different experience. This was a group of people who said, please don't call my parents or my parents don't know or I don't know how to talk, talk to my parents. I haven't been in contact with my family. And that, out of all of the things that washed over me, left a, a just an incredible mark, was these uncomfortable and very difficult, I mean, painful symptoms, but in the face of just deep emotional pain. Exactly. Um, so that, and and I think it's mentioned in the film in different ways at different times about all the folks who had to disclose to their family that they were dying of AIDS and that they were gay at the same time. They had to make those disclosures. And sometimes the parents had already known or the family, their biological family, and they had already been rejected um, or it was something that was never spoken about. And in some cases, it was uh, complete news. And, um, and a lot of that is going on today in different ways as well. Um, do we still have conversations we're not having around around um, trans rights, and, you know, the incredible number of, the horrifying number of trans women of color, mostly African-American trans women who get murdered, um, and what is happening to people who are homeless. We, there's conversations that we're not having. There's the news is slanted when when it is reported. Conversations around race. Mm -hmm. When I look at the coronavirus today, and I think, my goodness, all of the things that were at play when the AIDS epidemic broke are pretty much the same, maybe a little bit more intense today, but the elements are all there. And, and, and it's one of the things that I get to say a lot when I'm going around the country and promoting this film is that this is a history lesson for us. This was not just a freak incident in history. This is something that very easily could be repeated. And all the elements that were in play that allowed that kind of response at that particular time in the early 1980s are now present again. And we're in a situation where something like that could happen all over again. Indeed. We are becoming so much more aware of the social determinants of health and as I am hearing your story and then watching the modern day stories unfolding in front of our eyes, I think we need to start thinking about the political determinants of health. They, they certainly have an impact. We often share with the public when they ask about the role of a nurse and the licensure. And I find myself frequently reminding people that it is a license to touch, to touch physically, to mm. touch emotionally, spiritually, in addition to the technology. And 5B is such a 
beautiful portrayal of that license to touch. Guy, what does a license to touch mean to you as, as a nurse, as a human being, as an activist? That is beautifully said, and I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think, and and it's also we still something we still struggle with. In 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 the film, it's Mary McGee says beautifully. We we were allowed to love our patients, and and we express that in many ways. But one of them is touch, and um, and it's an ongoing struggle to be allowed to continue to do that. Our, much of our care now has, of course, improved. The technologies have improved. But also a lot of it is algorithm-driven and depersonalized and and so technological that it may interfere um, with that touch, um, you know, physical, emotional touch, however you want to interpret that. You could be a nurse and stare at a computer screen most of the time if you if you weren't careful. Um, the electronic medical record is a two-sided um, thing, and it could easily pull you away from the patient. So we have to make a conscious effort. And then there is there is the the other thing is that in order to touch, we also have to be we have to be proactive, and it, it, we have to we often have to overcome our own fears or prejudices. And for nurses in those days, it may have been, for some nurses, it may have been around touching people who are gay or have this strange virus that they don't know everything about. And and then nowadays, the discussion is, can healthcare professionals refuse to touch or even take care of people because of that healthcare provider's religious belief? And I'm very glad that nurses' uh, associations have spoken out strongly against that. It's our duty to care. It's our duty to really take good care of our patients. And that includes touch. Who are today's untouchables? For many of my physician colleagues and nurses' colleagues and others, it is the homeless. And uh, and it may be difficult sometimes if somebody has been living on the street without access to facilities, then it may be, um, it may be difficult. There, there may be issues of hygiene and smell, and, and people may be afraid also. Um, and yet, that is a challenge that we as nurses in particular, I feel, need to a- embrace, engage in. And and address and and not only in just a practical sense, like help somebody, re- you know, restore their own dignity, help them, you know, be be clean and nourished and and safe, um, but also to to ask why is this happening? This is um, I think it was a Catholic bishop, Dom Helder Camera, who says when I. Fed the homeless, I was called a saint. And when I asked when people are hungry, they called me a communist. And that, that is still happening in in our society today. There is a lot to be done, and all of us can do it. And uni- nurses are in a u- unique position to do something. But we have to do it. We can't wait for administration to tell us or physicians to tell us. We we have we're there we're often the first line of engagement you know with the medical system for a lot of the people we take care of so one of the strengths of the film is being able to have difficult moments in our history difficult moments in how as a country and as care professions we dealt with something that was new and unknown and scary. I think that there's also a place to smile about in, in this film. And when I'm, what I'm smiling about was the numbers of innovations, seeing a group of people rally and the movement of patient engagement, patient activism, healthcare activism, healthcare professionals taking a stand. And so I think that we might have a tendency to look at this documentary and feel a lot of weight, 
But I also think that it identifies opportunities where new ways to care, new ways to think about treating an illness or coming to a population and providing teaching and prevention um, and, and care management. Can you speak to some of those elements that you've identified in your career has continued and you've taken this experience of 5B into so many different avenues. Are you seeing any smiles in that? Absolutely. I mean, that is, that is to me, one of the most important and hopeful messages out of this um, film. And it is, again, that anybody can do something. Everybody can do something. And some of it is, is overtly political and activist. And, so, and a lot of it is just day-to-day -day stuff. And innovation. Nurses have been incredibly innovative and working with activists and researchers and and all the stakeholders. And it has transformed how hospitals work and how chronic care works. I remember back before, the days before HIV, it was a very physician-centered model of care often. And in places it still is, but it was the, the physician would diagnose and prescribe and the nurses would try to implement that and the patient was patient and compliant or not. And with HIV, all of that changed. You know, in the early days, it was very often patients who knew more about what was going on and what the latest research said than the physicians. And there were many physicians who were affected in their personal lives or with their friends, families themselves. Um, so it, it made for a less hierarchical uh, model. And then, again, you know, the, with 5B, later 5A, um, it was nurses who really took charge there and changed the rules. Yes, and yeah. that empathy assist, assisted us to learn from our patients because patients tell you what it is they need and they can help. They need to be partners in that drive towards innovation. You, you can't, you, it's not up to a caregiver to decide what's needed, to prescribe. It's, it's a two-way street. It's, it's you, you, need, you hear what, what the needs are. Yes, there are basic needs of, of physical caring, uh, you, know, scient you know, scientifically based care. Of course, those need to be addressed. But people can also inform and should inform what, what it is that will create a really healing and caring environment. And it's up to us as care caregivers to listen to that. And then we have the tools to make that happen. The compassion in your voice comes through so clearly and so beautifully, Allison. What touched you and what created that just deep core of compassion and caring to break through um, a barrier and maybe perhaps even your own fear, but definitely the fear of others and the fear that was palpable throughout the city and throughout society? Personally, well... I I am I believe I'm a compassionate person. I think I've I've been that way. You know, some of us we all have different attributes and I think that's one of mine and certainly it was encouraged in my in my home. And I, I as a nurse I learned that that what we could uniquely provide was that caring and compassion and that people get better faster when they feel comfortable, when they feel that they're accepted, when they're fe they feel that they're in an environment that's safe, that's caring. And if I could do anything, I felt, I feel still, this is what, this is something that I can do. I can't I, you know, I'm not a great artist. I'm not a great activist. I'm not the smartest person in the world. <laughs> but I have a heart. I know I have a heart and that I can sh I'm not afraid to share it. I, I must say that I, I wanted to encourage other people to, to contact that part of themselves too, other people in the hospital. I think the people that I, that I worked with came from that same sort of foundation in one way or another. 
As the days went on on the unit, though, um, I don't know if any of us could have been prepared for what we began to see and what we began to feel. So I think what one of the things I learned is that compassion can nurture itself if you give it free reign. We saw young people dying, and we saw young people before that become someone other than themselves because of a disease. It was scary. I mean, to me, it was scarier than fear of the presumed virus. We found that as we reached out our hands, as we, if you, if you just acknowledge your own humanity, you can be there for someone else. That's really all any of us are asking. But uh, what could we do? We couldn't save people's lives, but we could, as as you know, as they, we say in the film, we could care for them. We could create this environment for them and for their loved ones, where they where they were safe, where uh, they could they could continue to be themselves and as much as as much as they as they could be and where they could die if that's what it was coming to in a me- with a measure of peace so that became a fulfillment in itself to be able to do that nurses have a tremendous power to make things happen and i think nurse administrators too need to open up their eyes listen to their staff, listen to those arguments about the nursing care plan, you know, revisit, revisit the care issues. You know, it's nice to hear that the arguments that you had were over the principles of making sure that we were able to deliver the very best care and give people the best life and the best experience and make sure that they were surrounded by the people who made them laugh, who made them feel loved, who made them feel valued and that you surrounded the group of people that were interested in delivering that care with the courage and the tools and the mindset needed to do things in a different way and to drive drive what's become um, understood as the San Francisco model and truly an innovation in how we care for patients. Thank you, Allison, for Thank spending you, time with Shana. me. Thank you, Shauna. That was beautifully said. First of all, I have to tell you, when, when you said that you were a nurse, it really struck me. I love being interviewed by someone who who has an understanding of what I'm really talking about. <laughs> and, and, and that means a lot to me. It means a lot to me too, Cliff. Thank you. I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity. And I hope that people will will be inspired and realize that they don't have to wait for a leader to stand up and tell them what to do. You know in your gut what to do. And... You can, you can do it. You're as ready as you're ever going to be. Nurse and clinical educator Guy Vandenberg has worked as an activist, clinician, and director of programs providing services for injection drug users, sex workers, incarcerated persons, and homeless people living with HIV. The former 5B nurse has worked as a consultant for HIV care in prisons and jails across the U.S. and spent 10 years providing technical and training assistance with the rollout of antiretroviral treatment in Eastern and Southern Africa focused on the diagnosis and treatment of infants and children. Currently, Guy works at San Francisco General Hospital and he readily speaks up about how we can better embrace today's untouchables in healthcare. Cliff Morrison was a clinical nurse specialist at San Francisco General Hospital in 1980. As a result of the unit Morrison co-developed with his all-volunteer nursing staff, Ward 5B became globally recognized and studied, ultimately becoming the adopted standard of care around the world. Following his work at San Francisco General, Morrison served as a professor as well as an assistant dean of nursing at the University of San Francisco, among other San Francisco area educational institutions. He has been internationally recognized by AMFAR, twice been named Nurse of the Year, and is the recipient of a Lifetime Achievement Award by the Association of Nurses in AIDS Care. Today, 
Cliff manages an inpatient program in San Francisco for the developmentally disabled and those suffering from mental illness. Allison Moed served as Ward 5B's nurse manager for seven years. Her ongoing commitment to public health led her to pursue a graduate degree that ultimately inspired her return to San Francisco General, where she became director of risk management until she retired. Today, Moed resides in Northern California and regularly travels to Morocco, volunteering for a nonprofit that provides shelter and education to rural Moroccan girls. The film 5B takes us back to a defining moment in history and invites us to walk alongside the courageous nurses who were close to the problem and took action during extraordinary circumstances. Their account gives us a detailed, frontline perspective of American public health history and offers useful guidance to navigate this moment and also plan for the future. It's the wisdom of kindness and urgency that comes from being closest to the suffering. You can find the 5B film trailer at nursing.jnj.com. It's a great film to watch and to discuss in community with friends and families, colleagues and teens. I encourage you, I invite you to organize a watch party. You can view 5B on your favorite streaming platform by yourself, but it's way better with friends and the people you care about. And let us know what you think. Email us anytime at hello at seeyounowpodcast.com. For See You Now, I'm Shauna Butler. Thanks for listening and for watching. See You Now is created in collaboration with Johnson & Johnson and the American Nurses Association. Johnson & Johnson is proud to power up nurse-led innovation that is transforming health outcomes through skill building, leadership development, and more. The American Nurses Association ignites and celebrates nurse-led innovation to redefine quality nursing and advance health care for all. Download and subscribe to See You Now wherever you get podcasts and leave us a review while you're there. It helps millions of people find the show. To learn more about these programs and See You Now, visit seeyounowpodcast.com.